All right, thanks everyone for coming today. I know you all wish there was, was an outdoor session, but <laughs> nope, it's Vegas. So we're in here where you cannot see any natural light. So thanks for coming today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about balancing self-service analytics and governance. As long as there's been analytics, there has been this tension, right? And if you do the Wayback Machine, I see some people who are my age. Um, you'll remember business objects, you'll remember business objects, universes, Cognos, where like, the good news is everything was governed. The bad news was it was painful to get anything done, there was no freedom, there was no nothing. Then we swung the pendulum all the, the way the other way. We have tools like Tableau, which I'm very proud of, but it, it also just unleashed the door of letting analysts kind of do whatever they wanted to. And so getting to this notion of, you know, can you trust that data, what's there, that kind of got pushed in the service of, I could, I could explore anything I want, I could bring any data I want to the party. Now we're left somewhere in between. Everyone's trying to figure out how to balance the goodness that comes from both of those worlds, right? You want governance, you want those things, but you also want the goodness that comes from self-service analytics. You want to let people bring in data, really explore, and then find the, the key word is that balance and that happy medium. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Hopefully give you some you know, sense of that push and pull and a little bit of the state of the world, and, and at the end of the day, how you can get to a good DBT you know, a practice that helps you strike that right balance. So I'm your moderator today. I'm Mark Nelson. I'm currently a venture partner at Madrona, but I come off of a long operating career, most relevant for this discussion. I spent four and a half years running product and engineering and then was CEO at Tableau. Um, and I've got three great experts up here, Sarah, Patrick, and Celia, who are gonna uh, talk about this topic with me, and maybe I'll have you each introduce yourselves. Sure, thanks, Mark. Patrick Vinton, I'm Chief Technology Officer at Analytics 8. We're a data and analytics consultancy here in the US. Uh, I've started my, spent my whole career in data analytics, started off at MicroStrategy, so when Mark was talking about uh, tools that had very, um, basically, tightly, tightly governed, that, that was it. I mean, that was, that was that end of the, of the spectrum like that. Um, the good news about it is that's where I kind of developed my love affair of strong semantic layer, and I've been chasing that dragon ever since. So I started off on the product side, was a consumer of analytics when I ran the operations for what at the time was the fourth largest telecom in the US. And then ever since then, I've been on the services side. So I've had the privilege of, of working with a lot of customers and seeing large, medium, small customers implement a variety of tools and try to find this balance that Mark was talking about. Thank you. And I'm Sarah Levy from Tel Aviv. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Uno. And well, in the past 20 years or so, I've, I've been leading startups and working with data teams in various fields in healthcare, in cybersecurity, in finance, always great focus on leveraging data and AI. And you know, I've seen data teams work so hard to deliver quality data products to management and you know, developers working on developing trusted algorithms using AI. But there was often friction in collaboration and in technology, you know, the ability of analysts and engineers to work uh, in, a, in, a, in an aligned and synced way to, to, to understand the models, to understand, to, to navigate this, this you know, huge data space. And, and you know, that's, that's eventually resulting in data conflicts or even worse, bad data-driven decisions. And I've seen that over and over again. And eventually that's why I founded Uno. So you know is the data model governance platform that is designed to help your data team visualize, um, manage, and build data models across the entire stack, and most important, to do it together with the business. And we have a clear mission to help your data team um, balance this you know, freedom of self-serve with central governance, no matter how fast your company scales. So I'm very excited about this. I have my own. That doesn't work. What, what about now? Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, happy to see you here. Um, yeah, data teams go through different phases uh, in their maturity. You start from a one-person team. Something works for that team. It doesn't work for the ten-person team, and it definitely doesn't work for a hundred-person team. Um, I'm a senior analytics engineer at Bolt. We have more on that, like hundred, two hundred-person data team scale. And uh, for those of who who haven't used Bolt, we're the Uber of Europe and Africa, ride-hailing, ride deliveries, rentals. 
and like millions of orders every day. So there is a lot of data and we are using a lot of that data. And my role in the company is to look at how we're using the data, really see the pain points and then figure out what good looks like for the data teams and then go help them actually become good, the, the internal data teams. So that's what I do. Awesome. So, so let's start the discussion a little bit on what, what happens today. Where, where do you really see in practice data teams really creating models that are used and where do you see models kind of end up being ad hoc created in the BI tools, in a Tableau, in a Looker? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are using um, DBT core and we're using Looker. And there's a clear overlap in what they're offering in terms of data modeling at least. You can build your models, you can define your business logic in either of them actually. And it depends a little bit on your use case of what makes sense for you. You might not even need DBT if you have a small setup, if you can do everything in your BI tool. But if you grow out of that scale, you want to use data outside of the BI tool, you need to find a better place where to store that single business logic. You don't want to duplicate that, right? Yes, that kind of answers the where. I mean, I'm going to kind of press on the when part of your question. So when do we do X versus Y? Uh, the reality is what I see across our customer base and when I talk to people out here is there's really not a, a really good concerted plan. It's not like, all right, today we're going to decide to make it here and then we're going to do it there. The reality is what typically happens is an analyst or anybody that needs to perform analytics, they're going to figure out a way to get their job done. If there's already a transformations downstream performed for them, great. Then they can just run a report or they can perform a query. Perfect. But they're going to figure out the way to get it. And sometimes that means just like export to Excel and do data transformations there, uh, trying to figure out how to do that. Otherwise, they're going to do it inside the tool. But eventually what happens is something that that analyst does, somebody keys into that and they say, all right, I want to see that over and over and over. And I want to see that next month. So that's the part where it becomes prime time. Um, one of our customers happens to be, uh, my best knowledge, I think they're the biggest Tableau install on, on, on the planet. Um, they said uh, Tableau is where people go, where analysts and users go to throw something against the wall, and DBT is where things go prime time and go for the. So it's, in some ways, it's very healthy that there's not like this perfect rule and it, these things kind of just happen organically within an organization. It gives people the freedom to explore and create new things and then eventually make it industrial strength by rolling it backwards in the stack. Yeah. So that's kind of a happy path where like the things end up where they should. Talk to me a little bit about like just where the bottlenecks are. So you've created these nice data models but your, your Tableau and Looker users ignore them anyway and use the BI tools. <laughs> So, I mean, as part of my role, you know, founding, you know, I think I interviewed over 250 data leaders, part of them, I mean, almost all of them using DBT. So that's definitely the industry standard. Everyone wants to centralize their logic in DBT. And, and DBT gives you the power to build your entire data model, uh, right? Even metrics. So you don't even need to save Lucumel for metrics anymore. You can build your entire data model, govern it, document it, version control it, test it. Everything's great. But, you know, analysts, they work so fast with the business under very, very strict timelines, and they need to deliver the reports on time. And analytics engineer, all the engineers and data engineers, they, they often cannot keep up with the rate at which things change on the business side. And it's not just keeping up. I mean, it's not just every other metric or definition that is created on the business side is going to stay there forever. 90%, 90 percent will be thrown away. It's just, you know, experiments. You want to try new business terms as you go. You want to test your analysis. You want to do it fast. You want to deliver results. And if you wait for analytics engineers to model everything for you, you just, that's just too much friction. And who wants to slow down the business? So one big challenge is how to keep up with the business. This creates extreme bottlenecks for data engineers. And the other part, and I think Celia can elaborate more on that, is that when you work with DBT, you have a lot of duplicate work to do. So you build a model in DBT, now you need to build a view in LookML to expose this model to Looker users. You build um, a table in DBT, you need to create a published data source or data source in Tableau for Tableau users to do this. So there is a lot of duplicated work. You created a metric in Looker, now you want it in DBT. You now need to code it in DBT or create a pre-aggregated. So a lot of things are done twice. So that's also another source of 
many bottlenecks yeah, are created. And yeah, Celia, I, I know, I mean, I, we've spoken a lot in the past <laughs> six months, so I know she's experiencing this. I am indeed experiencing the feeling. We have a lot of duplication already, just considering the fact that we have loads of models that duplicate the same logic or that look similar, they use similar data sources, but then like the outcome is slightly different, slightly fi different filters or whatever it is. So there's that part, just like trying to do the work only once within one tool, but then now we get into more tools. So <laughs> trying not to do the same work in all the tools that we have, like we don't want to do the same work for, for, for BI, for data science, for machine learning, just being able to do that once and kind of keeping it in sync especially if you don't have to always push people to DBT, because for data analysts, sometimes it's creating barriers. I'm, if I'm gonna say to, to everyone that you're not allowed to do anything elsewhere, DBT is there, do it there. Well, they're gonna have to learn a new tool or they're gonna have to like, really jump over barriers to do this. But if we can enable something more convenient for everyone where they design their stuff, they play with their stuff, and then if we need to, we centralize, that would be so much more convenient than, like, there's no point in putting up rules if they're not going to be followed. And building upon that and Patrick's earlier comment on like the BI tools is where you play with things and then they graduate to prime time. How do they graduate to prime time? Like if you're, if you're an analytics engineer, how do you actually understand the data that your analysts are actually playing with? How do you understand what should actually get graduated and surfaced? Well, I think some of that you know, these are the conversations I have a lot with our customers. And, you know, a lot of the customers we have, of course, we do technical implementations, but how do I organize my company? How do I organize and how do I attack these problems? So it's one of the things, the challenges we've got that organizations in general have is like right now they're kind of caught in between operating models. Like we were traditionally we've had data engineers and we've had front end people and we've had end users. Now a lot of these things are getting blurred and they're getting blurred for very good reasons. So, um, I'm not exactly answering your question yet, but I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> I think the role of an analyst, what is, what is an analyst? I think that is, that's in flux. And so, you, you know, an analyst today is like, well, a, a recent history is like, I need to be the expert on the business. I need to be the expert on the business rules here. And then I need to collaborate with a data engineer or somebody back here to put this into, into, in, into motion. Now what we're seeing is the role of the analyst changing. It's like that person needs to straddle both. And so... I think it's just part of the evolution we had in, in, in the industry, as we have with it, all things in the tech industry. And, and maybe to touch a bit more on, I mean, Celia said um, and that it, there's no point in putting rules if no one's going to follow them. And, and you asked about, you know, what, what, how can analytics engineers, data engineers, actually figure out what's happening on this BI side, on the analyst side? So. You cannot put rules in place that no one will follow. And one thing I heard over and over again is just you cannot govern analysts. I mean, they will find their ways, right? They will, they will write their SQL statement. They will create a spreadsheet in Excel if they need. They will just get the data from the warehouse, do their analysis. No one can stop them. And now go figure out what they've built in those you know, data sources in Tableau that join a DBT table with a CSV and build on top three calculated fields that are then used in a dashboard that suddenly becomes the, you know, the company KPIs and everyone's using this dashboard. So one big piece is visibility, really understanding what's happening there, how things are connected, how every duplicated or similar definition is actually calculated and how often it's used. The, there might be like 20 different definitions to daily active users, but there is actually really one that is used across the organization. If you have visibility into that, everything that exists, who uses what, you can start figuring out what needs to go into DBT. So visibility and utilization is, is a big gap that I keep hearing about all the time. Yeah, and you said you can't stop data analysts from doing this stuff, but what really you can do is give them some help because it's not like I work in a team of data analysts and it's not like they want to do shitty stuff. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> they actually, they're happy to put in place like really good data sets, except that they don't always know how to do that. So if we have some guidelines and some rules of like, okay, if you want to build a pre-aggregated data table, put it there, make it look like this, make sure it has these and these components. 
And then like, if you, if you want to do some specific analysis, do it there. Make, su make sure you use these other things that we already have from other data teams. Maybe you can rely on something that has been already built. You don't need to build it from scratch. So just give them these like, helping things, and they'll be happy to follow most of the time, unless you make it inconvenient. But don't do that. <laughs> yes, Tableau gives you all the rope. It's just a matter of whether you hang yourself or not. <laughs> so. Um, awesome. Well, we made it halfway through the panel without saying AI, so now I'm going to say AI. Because um, certainly part of why models are having a moment is because everyone's realizing if you want to actually use AI, you, you need a good model. Like if you just point AI at, at data, it's kind of garbage in, garbage out. So you know, what, what is it that company needs, need, companies need to do to really lay the groundwork for their analytics teams to actually work with AI? I guess I'll take this one at least to start. Um, yeah, halfway through, that was pretty good. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I, when I talk to to our customers about planning an AI strategy, it's, there's just basically two fundamentals for this to talk about. One is think when you think about what to do, think about making it easy for AI. And so that's like some basic, basic housekeeping. Keep keep a good tidy house. Keep a data model that's easy to consume. Do good documentation. Create a semantic layer. Uh, you know, have uh, good plain English definitions of everything, incorporate a glossary, do things to make it easy to get the institutional knowledge or the, the knowledge that's in a few engineers' brains out for somebody to consume and that AI can consume it. The next kind of guiding principle I talk about when I, about AI and what is just know that things are gonna be different in like a very short period of time and be okay with that. Don't bet it all on one particular approach. And typically what that means, it goes back to what I just talked about is just Get the basic fundamentals. Get some good hygiene with your data. Make sure everything's well documented in the way. Shore up your processes. Shore up your governance policies. Shore up, you know, some of those things, and you'll be set. Yeah, and I think Patrick, you, you mentioned earlier your your excitement and interest in metrics layers. So, with I mean, with AI, if you want to be AI ready, sooner or later you will need to centralize your metrics. You need to build this layer that provides context into your data. That's how those tools will be able to interpret the data and, and, and understand, you know, and be able to, to give you trustworthy answers based on the data. You need it to differentiate between, you know, the entire set of duplicates that are just experiments that no one's really using from the actual, you know, governed uh, uh, metrics that reflect the, the definitions that the business wants you to use, and, and also to get context. Now, the problem with metrics layer, so, so Definitely AI brings uh, semantic layers and metrics layers back to the front stage. Everyone's interested again. And it's been there for several years now, but uh, the interest you know, uh, uh, increases now. And I think the problem is that the technology exists. DBT is one, but there are other standards for, you know, you can write YAML files using different standards. Some are open standards, some are not. But the technology exists, the integrations exist. And I think the missing piece is the workflow. How do you make it work? How do you decide what should go there? Who decides what goes there based on what? I mean, there are dozens of new metrics created every day in every business domain. That's everything goes into the semantic layer. Or so who decides? How do you add things there? How do you use them? How do you know how to find them? I think the workflow piece is, is a big piece into this story that now needs, I mean, requires some innovation and a lot of thought to do it right. Yeah, and I've been actually trying to do that for my company uh, for more than a year now. And um, there are some things that I've learned in the process. One of them is that at least get the basics there. We've got things like number of finished orders in every domain. Just try to get that defined, like revenue, costs. Like, you know, it's, it sounds super basic, but you can't imagine how many companies, including ours, uh, are having difficulties reporting to the CEO, like, what's the revenue number last month? Like, it's kind of around there, but not, like, <laughs> there's, like, this definition and that. And even in our case, we have defined some, and I started from actually implementing in metrics layer the most used definition. Well, it turns out it's not the one that is the correct definition. Uh, the correct one apparently is owned by the finances, and it depends on a different timestamp. So that's something that I also learned that we previously, we used to work with tables and columns. Now we need to work with metrics, but it's not only about the metric definition as in like take that column and aggregate that into a sum, 
but it's also about a date because most of the time you're going to put things on a timeline and you need to understand whether you're using the order created date or, or the order finished date or the billing date or whatever date for every metric. And then if you start combining those metrics like cost over revenue, like are you using the same dates? Does it even make sense to divide one with the other? All of these little details, like you actually have to start thinking about them. And it's, it's interesting when you're forced to put them in code, you're forced to think about these things. Otherwise, if you have a confluence glossary, you can write anything there. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that. You can't write anything in code. You have to. It's black and white. This column or that column? You have to decide. Cool. So as we talk about data modeling and how this really gets done, there's been a little bit of the DevOps mentality coming over into analytics on like, well, just teach your data analysts how to create a data model. Like That's the right answer. Of course, there's the same pushback of like every time you teach a data analyst or require them to do data engineering and data modeling, they're not doing their job of analyzing data. Like, how do you see that evolving? What do you think? Like, what's the right balance and the right approach to this? Well, I can tell from my experience that there are two kinds of reactions. The good reaction is that the person actually likes this kind of work. You can immediately see how they grab onto the concepts. They love the idea that someone is finally explaining them how, like, what are the concepts, like, what are the pieces that they're working with, and they love following the rules. They're like, oh, finally, I know how to do this. And then there's this other side where it's like, do I really, like, why do I need to, like, do I, why, like, I have my other job, like, I have a deadline, don't, don't push me there. So, so I think it's about finding those people who really want to work, like, in the DevOps mindset and using them because then they can be the ones supporting the, the people who are more on the actual, like, actual analytics side, the ones who are actually into the business context and want to make those decisions. And they're happy to, use whatever like good assets that others have prepared so there's a bit of a maybe a split between like what do you actually like to do and what you're good at and just keep doing that yeah I, I definitely see those patterns at the individual level but i also see patterns at the organizational level like i see patterns where the, you know the definition of an analyst may go back to what you just called the traditional analytics and then the engineering's reserved for the engineers where I see it kind of, the, those get a little more blurry. The patterns I see there is, one is like if, if the company is a high tech company and the average person there is more data savvy, more tech savvy, um, we see that a lot actually where there was a spin off of another company that you know it was a, some company that had this and it had a, had a technical arm they spun off and the relic of that, those typically, the, the, the lines are really blurry about what is an engineer, what is an analyst. Um, companies whose primary product offering is a data product. Somebody who, or somebody who like really, data monetization is a big part of their, of their, of their business and, and part of their mindset. And so by definition, if that's your product, if that's what it is you're selling, that gets kind of blurry. You know, what is an engineer, what is an analyst? Um, same thing where we see like in B2B companies where uh, you're providing data as a service. It's not exactly your product, but if you're working with collaborating with your customers, let's say you've got an account portfolio of like a half dozen accounts, um, and the, you're exchanging information with each other monthly, and you're returning some stuff back to them every month as part of your agreement with them, and that's a situation where you you're able to better man, be a better account manager for that. You're not even talking about an analyst. This is somebody where it gets even blurrier. You're on the front end. You're on the the, the tip of the spear, so to speak with engaging with customers. You want to be able to, for those situations, we see companies at an organizational level start to redefine what even is an account manager? What is the person in, in sales even do? But maybe just to share an, an anecdote about that. It's obviously a range, and there are different tech skill levels in an organization, in a data organization. And eventually, would you want everyone to be able to contribute using their interfaces. I think when DBT just started, obviously it was targeted uh, for analysts, right? It's based on SQL, analysts know SQL, they will be able to code things in DBT. And then what happens eventually is that the skill of DBT is shifted from the hands of analysts to the hands of data engineers with the great invention of analytics engineers, which is actually exactly 
you know, the, this profession, this bridge, they still understand the business, they understand what analysts need to do, how they need to leverage data. So they're not in the business of making data-driven decisions, but they have the engineering mindset. And I think this is a key um, uh, skill here. It, it requires an engineering mindset to code things right. It's not just mastering the language. It's to do proper engineering. And, and this is why also it's so difficult and so interesting to collaborate in this space. Yeah, for sure. OK, so then the payoff question. So what strategies really work? Like, what have, what have you all seen that, that really works for this? And what are some of the pitfalls? I'm put on the spot here. <laughs> well, really, like one thing that we have been doing is um, like pushing ownership in the right place. Um, domains owning their own data and preparing their own data and then reusing what has been prepared by others. I think that's definitely something that has worked for us, that has helped us. Just in general, trying to think what we're doing there. <laughs> Not just doing something, but also thinking the big picture of what we're doing. I think that's been useful for us. Yeah, I think that goes into something I was about to say is the big picture. And big picture is we use data to drive the business. Unless you, your product is a data product, data is there to serve the business. And I think sometimes I see these, this kind of back and forth and fighting internally among companies about, well, no, this is my job, or this is your job, or whose job is it? And this territorial behavior, if you guys, the organizations that, are, that, are, that realize this is a mechanism to advance the business, those are the ones that I see that are most successful. And whatever push and pull, those things all work themselves out with that mindset. Yeah, it, it's just that. I mean, the whole reason for this data stack is making data-driven decisions, right? The, uh, again, unless it's a data product company, it's a data-based product company, but, but you build this data stack, you invest millions in this to be able to make data-driven decisions. So this is what drives the responsibilities, this is what drives the priorities, this is why quality of your data and quality of your data models is becoming so important because you need your numbers to make sense. You need to be able to trust your numbers. Otherwise, why do you invest so much money in that, right? If you don't trust which is the revenue of your, of your organization, okay, you, just, you, you may just guesstimate and save a lot of money that is spent in your data stack. So, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, we're just about time. We probably have time for one or two questions from the audience. If there are folks brave, interested enough to answer a question, ask a question, we've got one over there. Mark, you've been playing the MC, but I'm sure you have your own thoughts around this topic, right? <laughs> can you share with us like, how you see this space? Um, sure, I can, I can elaborate a little bit. I mean, so this, is, this topic was always huge for us at Tableau, right? I mean, if you saw the kind of the tip of our spear of our marketing, it was about creating a data culture, right? Because very proud of Tableau, I'd say it's the best visual analytics tool on the market. But as I said, it gave you all this rope to hang yourself. And so there was this continual look for help to help organizations actually get there because you could buy a lot of Tableau and do a lot of good. You could buy a lot of Tableau and not do a lot of good. Um, and so this is one that we tried to solve through education. And this is why I'm excited to see products like you know coming on the market to really help people figure this out. And why you know, DBT is an amazing tool because it really lets you do the back end of that at code. All of this becomes a very virtuous stack and cycle, um, but it is still like there is no magic tool, right? Like this is not this is not the problem created by DBT. Is not a problem created by Tableau. Like it is a, is a human organization problem, and so it's finding the right tools, it's finding the right maturity, it's figuring out how to put this all together to get this very virtuous cycle, which I think the panel did a great job of describing. Yeah. Hi, uh, so something I'm trying, and I wonder if any of you have experience with this, is that um, I've basically structured security along with you know, what people have access to and also the skill level that they have to have. So everyone in the company starts out analyst level one, just to get that mindset they're an analyst and just curated sources, access through a BI tool. Then they show interest and want to 
have training, analyst level two, some notebooks, staging tables so they could add other things and have a space they could save data instead of just a file that they're uploading and encourage them for that visibility of what they're doing. And then analytics engineer, DBT models and so forth. Have you, any of you tried that and had any success and, or failure? <laughs> I really like the idea of tiering the um, kind of uh, skill level. No, we haven't done that before. I think there is like in some parts, yes, we have like a DBT maintainers um, group that has more permissions to approve pull requests and act more uh, duty to actually review the pull requests uh, in a meaningful way from the technical perspective. So in a way we do have a tiering, but it's not may maybe as official, but I think it's a very good idea to help analysts also understand where they are and where they could be. So I think it's a, it's a good tool. Sounds like it. Maybe one last question. Anything to foster data literacy throughout the organization, whether it's tiering, whether it's a game system, whether it, anything to foster data literacy is, is gonna pay dividends. So maybe it's a tiering system, like you mentioned, maybe it's a test, maybe it's just healthy culture, whatever that is, it, that, that's what's gonna work ultimately. So it kind of depends on the culture of your org. Cool. All right, well I think we'll call it here. Can we have a hand for our panelists?